you can go ahead, Patricia. Obrigado. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, and and thank you so much, Irina, for the privilege of of being here with you today and and of sharing uh, the space with with uh, with this wonderful group of people. And um, my, my contribution specifically is as as um, as Marisa just mentioned about the Amazon and. Um, I, I have been thinking a bit about this idea of, of the end of the world because uh, uh, what we have, what we are facing in many ways is really the end of certain worlds. And um, Katarina also talked to us about that, about how a given uh, way of, of existing and of, of inhabiting a certain place ceases to exist uh, for a number of, of, of different reasons in her case for because of, of, of brutal extractivism, right? And in, in the COP uh, that is going on now, we have also been hearing about um, the end of the world, or at least the, uh, the end of the impending end of the world, right? In, in a very different way. So there is all of this imagery of the apocalypse and how uh, we we are reaching a, a point of no return and so on. So I feel that all of this uh, rhetoric of the end of the world and of the apocalypse is very present in, in discourses about, um, about uh, the environment. So what I wanted to bring to you are just examples of three different versions of, of this apocalypse and of this end of the world that touch upon indigenous issues and upon the Amazon that I have uh, been researching. And the first example comes from a Western cultural background broadly understood with, with all the quotation marks that we, we might want to put on it. And then the other two versions of the end of the world are by indigenous people from the Amazon. And what I wanted to do is to contrast these three um, perspectives and of, of, of the end of the world and to show how artworks can, can really be an intervention on the way we reflect upon and, and, and consider some, some of these issues that, that, that are really becoming more and more present as the end of a certain kind of world or a certain kind of way of inhabiting the world is becoming uh, closer and closer to us. And so um, I will, uh, I have a small presentation and, and uh, the first uh, uh, version of the end of the world that I, I wanted to bring to you uh, is um, uh, from a film that you probably all know, the Mad Max um, series of, of movies. And, um, and I wanted to start by a reflection on, on this uh, end of the world and the, on the Anthropocene, because it seems that whenever we talk about it, there is this idea that uh, the apocalypse is coming closer and that the four horsemen of the apocalypse are arriving and so on. And so I wanted to relate this to these movies, Mad Max, uh, and especially uh, to um, put those movies in dialogue with an artwork by a Brazilian artist called Denilson Baniwa, uh, who is from the Baniwa tribe of, of the northwestern region of, of the Amazon. And he does a very interesting work because it's very ironical. And what he does, he modifies stills from very famous films. And he chose a still from the Mad Max series. And he kind of indigenized this hero, Mad Max, as you can see here on the screen. So this is from uh, Mad Max to the Road Warrior, uh, played famously by Mel Gibson, right? So you have this uh, male hero, Mad Max, with his dog and so on. And then Baniwa adds indigenous features to this, um, to this quintessential Western hero, uh, the feathered headpiece, the bow and the arrows and so on. Um, and, and of course, this is done, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, very ironically, but I think it prompts us to, um, uh, to think about what would Mad Max look like if it were done from an indigenous perspective. So what would change and how would this version of, of the end of the world that we find in Mad Max, how would it be different if it came 
uh, from, from an indigenous point of view. So what would the apocalypse look like, so to speak, if we were to see it from the other side? And uh, I mean, I'm sure you all know that this Mad Max, well, I didn't know this Mad Max book, uh, this Mad Max series before I started to work on, on Baniwa. So I had to go ahead and watch all of these movies, which were was a bit boring, uh, frankly. Uh, but, but basically these are mo movies that take place for those of you who have had the chance um, and that have had the good fortune really not to have watched them because they're really quite brutal. Uh, but these are movies that are set in a kind of post-apocalyptic scenario. Uh, and uh, it's never clear what the apocalypse uh, was, but sometimes the movies refer to fuel wars, sometimes to fuel shortages. Uh, the latest in installation of the movie or instantiation of the movie, it's about water shortages. So there are all these um, environmental issues that are the background of the movie. Uh, and what I find um, very striking, I had a clip of the movies, but you can then just watch them in your own time if, if you feel so inclined. What I find uh, shocking about these movies is that you have all of these car chases, fumes, uh, the engines uh, running loudly and so on. But there doesn't seem to be a connection between this fossil fuel driven um, industry and the environmental catastrophe that is at the background of the movie. So the two things are left unrelated in the movie. So uh, you have on the one hand, all of this almost orgiastic, fetishistic glorification of speed of cars, of fossil fuels and so on. And on the other hand, you have a desert or a desert like landscape but it's never made clear in the movies that the deserted landscape is because of this reliance on fossil fuels, right? So this connection is completely absent from the movies and I think it's really a glaring blind spot. And as I researched more into these movies, I saw that they, they are really extremely popular and not just you know, with people who like cars. And I remember having a conversation with a colleague from Coimbra a professor of, of philosophy, no less, who was telling me, you know, the last Mad Max um, uh, movie is the best movie ever made. You know, it's it's just wonderful. And I was um, impressed that, you know, this appeals to people and, and not just to a small segment of people, but it's something that strikes a chord in our culture, right? And so that's why I found it was uh, so interesting uh, what Baniwa did to the movies, because it, it made us wonder uh, uh, really what an indigenous perspective on these very same topics uh, would look like. And um, just to um, refer to, to some of the, of the things that I think Baniwa does, on the one hand, I think it's, um, uh, it, he draws attention to, to, the, to what we mean by civilization, right? Because uh, of course, indigenous people were considered always to be the uncivilized, those who have no culture and so on, those who are barbaric. And here in these movies, by indigenizing the main character, I think he's leading us to, um, to question what it means to be civilized, really. Is that really uh, the epitome of civilization, all of these car chases and, and, and uh, violence and so on? And this this so, sort of um, uh, environmentally damaging uh, fossil fuel lifestyle, really, uh, what we should aim at in order to become civilized, uh, according to the Western version of, of civilization, right? And then just another um, thing, I uh, just to be brief, that I think the Baniwa is, is discussing is the issue of, of um, a kind of toxic masculinity that is depicted in these movies, uh, because not only do we have a male hero throughout most of these series, now in the latest movie, there's also a, a very strong woman, but still I think that even the, the, the woman character who's played by Charlize Theron, she still ado adopts many of typically male way of behavior. She just happens to be a woman, but you know, all the all the values that she embodies are 
uh, traditional um, male values. And of course, the fixation on cars, on speed, uh, on trucks and motorbikes, it's kind of related to an imaginary that we tend to associate to white heterosexual uh, men uh, in, in the West, right? And this is the kind of worldview that has really shaped this, the Anthropocene and this end of, of the world that we are facing. And then there is also this idea of, of the cowboy, right? The, the lone uh, man who is bringing civilization to, to these uncivilized people and, and uh, uh, working in a frontier space and so on. And so um, I think this is what Mad Max embodies as, as a character. And um, I think this, this really, uh, this, this, this familiar picture is changed in, in Baniwa's um, work because for one, it reminds us of, of the connection between these uh, supposedly civilizing figures uh, and, and sexual violence in the context of indigenous communities. And I, I'm not sure if Katerina um, encountered that in, in her research, but of course in the Amazon, this was very prevalent, right? Uh, many of the people who supposedly went to civilize and to evangelize the indigenous communities were the ones who were the perpetrators of, of sexual violence. And so it really leads us to question what, what civilization and culture is, what what barbarism is, and, and really, um, I think it also leads us to, to question how to face this notion of the end of the world, because as some of the indigenous people of the Amazon say, for them, the end of the world already happened. Uh, it happened once they were colonized, right? So uh, what in the West uh, uh, is reflected upon with so much much uh, anticipation, which is, you know, the apocalypse, the world is ending and so on. For these people, the world or a kind of world already ended. And I was, as I was listening to Katerina, I think this, this is also the case in, in, her, uh, in her background, right? The, the world already ended uh, in, in, in those islands, right? So I think those people have a lot to teach us about how to face up to the end of the world and how to work through that concept and maybe uh, to see how that end of the world and that story of the apocalypse might go in a different direction, learning uh, from those past experiences. And then just um, uh, uh, not to finish on a grim note, I wanted to uh, present um, another film that I, uh, I think is very powerful because it's really a denunciation of the apocalypse. And I wanted to show you just a, a, a few seconds in the very beginning. I'm sorry, this, this, I didn't have it in English, but basically you can see the anger of the woman. She's just accusing um, people of destroying the rivers and the forests and so on. So, um, sorry. So she's just uh, pointing literally a finger at, at people who are um, destroying her homeland in the Amazon, right? And, and you can see her anger and, and it's clear that she's not just fighting for a cause, it's really, uh, the whole existence of her community is at stake and she's just uh, pointing the finger, right? And so here, so uh, just just as, um, as I was saying, so here it's another version of the end of the world, right? So you have this woman facing the end of her world and, and the end of her existence really as, as she used to. And, 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 and you have an accusation uh, really uh, and, and this idea that, that white people, uh, as she calls them, so non-Indigenous people are creating ruins. And this idea of ruination, uh, I think comes through in Katerina's work as well, and is very powerful in the Amazon. So the idea of, of uh, Western style way of inhabiting the world as, as a way that leaves ruins behind. So everything that, that stays behind is just ruined. And in the Amazon, I think that is visually expressed um, by those uh, stumps of burned trees that remain after the forest fires 
Uh, I think that's a very clear image of, of that ruination of the environment. Uh, I think in Katerina's work, that's some of, some of the things that I saw are really these bare bones of, of, of the land after, after all the soil has been stripped. So it reminded me I'm, in, in a different context of that idea of ruination and of, of leaving behind the wasteland really, which is what happens in Mad Max. You also have just a wasteland, but there's no reflection as to the causes of that wasteland. And I think this is where uh, some of these indigenous artworks are more savvy because they dig into the causes and they also look into the future. So what could be done uh, to prevent that? So this, this is the issue of, of ruins that I was discussing. And so um, just to end, um, uh, I, I wanted to um, emphasize that um, this indigenous film and some other indigenous films that have been produced um, in the past few years, uh, I think their power is not only that they are other versions or alternative versions of how we could approach this idea of the end, uh, but they also, their value, and I think this also speaks to Katerina's work, is that they are themselves, these movies produced by and made by indigenous filmmakers, which is something fairly new in, in the Amazon, because traditionally, indigenous people were the ones who were filmed. They were uh, the objects of the cinematic gaze, so they were on the other side of the camera, and they were presented as exotic, as strange, uh, and so they were there for the contemplation of an audience uh, that was supposed to see them as, as almost as those wildlife documentaries, right? So uh, they were something that was strange and that we could sit at home, we in the West and, and observe and, and somehow contemplate. And so here we have something different. It's, it is an indigenous person who made this particular film. And, and this is the film of his community Right, so they, they own it and they speak in their own voices. And I think it's important because we were just mentioning the issue of diversity and uh, diversity is not just a diversity of, of spoken languages, but a diversity of ways of seeing. And in, in, through cinema, you can really present that different gaze and, and um, a different way of seeing the world that is then transmitted through the camera even though this of course has a number of issues related to the heritage of, of the language of cinema that is Western, but I think indigenous filmmakers are trying to, to work through that. Um, and so um, uh, to finish, um, I would like to end with something that one of these uh, indigenous uh, women says in, in, this, in this movie, because um, in the end, she says that, you know, we're destroying everything. Again, the topic of the end of the world, uh, everything is, is becoming a ruin. But she says, when all the rivers dry up, your children, so you're of, of the ones who are ruining things, your children will also die of thirst. So basically, even though there are all of these different ways of approaching the end of the world, when it does come, it will reach everyone and it will touch everyone. And so I guess at, at, the some, at some basic level, everyone is on the same boat. And I would, I would even add not only all people, but also all beings, human and non-human. And I think this is a very sobering and, and humbling um, reflection. And I, I wanted to end there. Thank you so much.